Welcome to episode 80 of the Cloudcast. Once again, the guys are slacking off. So this is Amy Lewis, that's at Comms Ninja on Twitter, host of Engineers Unplugged, and I'm taking over as queen of all media, or at least this podcast. This week, we're coming to you live from our unplugged Cloudcast studios here in Silicon Valley at Cloud Connect and DeployCon. Uh, with no further ado, I have two very, very special guests here with me. And uh, they've already taken over the podcast. I hijacked it from Brian and Aaron. They've hijacked it from me. So I'm just going to stand back and let Alistair and Dave introduce themselves, and we'll take it from there. Thanks, Amy. Um, I'm Alistair. I, uh, I've turned ADD into a career. So I spent a lot of time running conferences, uh, writing books, and uh, I've started a few tech companies just to prove that I'm uh, – I, I firmly believe that those who can't criticize or write books. So I needed to redeem myself a bit. Uh, but this week I'm here um, helping to put together the content for Cloud Connect. Uh, talking a little about lean IT, and also uh, talking about the consequences of big data on society, and a little bit about a book I just published with a guy named Ben Yoskovitz called Lean Analytics. And I'm Dave McCrory, that's uh, at McCrory on Twitter. I'm sure you'll have to look on the Cloudcast uh, site to see how to spell it. Uh, but um, I have uh, I work as the uh, SVP of engineering for Warner Music Group. I'm building... Uh, a a next generation solution for them and I also am the coiner of the term data gravity uh, and uh, continue to talk about that uh, anywhere and everywhere that I can. So before we pushed play or record or whatever we decided to push here, uh, you guys were telling me about a conversation you had once that we were hoping to reconstruct. So can you tell me a little more and the listeners? So I believe I I don't know if I reached out to Alistair or Alistair reached out to me. It's it's difficult for me to remember who initiated, uh, but uh, we were trying to go down the rabbit hole of uh, of data gravity and kind of uh, what what it was, uh, how it worked, and such. Um, how, how much do you remember about our conversation? So I, I don't remember who started it, but the the real point was that I think Dave had been struggling or grappling with this idea that. Um, data has gravity, meaning that once you have a lot of data, it kind of wants more data, and the logical conclusion of this is one big amorphous blob of data in the middle of the universe, uh, or in the real world, one very big cloud provider. And there are reasons why it might not just be one really big cloud provider, but all else being equal, there's this tendency towards that. And Dave called me and he sort of said, I got it. I think I figured it out. It's trade agreements. That's right. That's right. Uh, And the idea, at least at the time, was that uh, you had two. Uh, there's this idea of a uh, of the theory of, of trade or gravity model of trade, and the idea behind the gravity model of trade is that you have uh, two uh, two countries that are going to enter into some type of trade agreement, and uh, and there needs to be an analysis of what is actually a fair trade between uh, countries, and so the way that's done is by looking at Uh, looking at the largest city uh, in each of the two countries and deciding uh, just what a uh, what trade would look like between those and that involves uh, what's the size of the city the population uh, the density the location of the city so how difficult is it to shuffle goods from one of those cities to the other do you have to fly over mountains do you have to take a a a boat Um, what's the distance like Uh, How easy is it? Uh, And then in addition, uh, what type of goods they produce? And this all, is like the Sim City of data. This is what. Yeah. <laughs> yes, it, it very much is, and and so that determines how difficult or easy it is for these for these cities to uh, both export and import goods. Um, uh, you know, when I when I, I like to put my data on a hard drive and leave it there so it can't get out, and then watch it go crazy. <laughs> that's, a, that's my Sim City of data it. model. 
Just leave it for a really long time right. and see what tornadoes and little clouds pop over up. its head. I've exactly. got all your information. That's right. <laughs> That's right. Exactly. And so what ends up happening uh, is uh, generally uh, one is advantaged over another, um, and so there needs to be some type of equalization. Uh, and there also needs to be loud planes that fly yep, around. They're sending a drone for Dave. Obviously, this is so cutting edge they, that he's going to be taken out shortly. That's yeah. That's it's not a very good drone. It's not loud. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. The world's exactly. worst drone. So uh, ultimately, when they're developing a trade agreement, they end up uh, they end up taking these factors into account to see uh, how they can come up with some type of equivalency between the two. And there's actually like a real mathematical formula for this. That's like. Mountains times swamps plus people divided by taxation plus silk trade or some there's something like that that, that actually allows them to build a model of that's right the gravity between the two the two trade nations that's right and what generally happens is you pick the largest cities because they're the likeliest to import more goods consume more things and have more res- uh, more dollars to consume these goods uh, and it's actually why it's how they figure out what a tariff between one country versus another is to make them so that there's a e- equality in the trade agreement. Uh, and they run this model. It's fascinating stuff to read about uh, as far as uh, why one country will have a tariff and another doesn't, or uh, why there'll be subsidies. All of these things are driven around the around these uh, uh, gravity models of trade. Uh, so it's really interesting. Uh, and so I began to draw the analogy between that and uh, and what we do with data. Because so, you've been, you, up until then, you've been looking for a mathematical model to explain how likely it was that all the data would wind up in one place and what forces might keep data separate. So that why would there be one big giant like Amazon S3 at the center of the universe versus one per country or, you know, 10 providers in the U.S.? And your assumption, I think, at the time was that there was a mathematical tension between this need for everything to go. So maybe we should step back for a second and just explain, you know, the Jim Gray idea. So Jim Gray was a brilliant uh, Microsoft engineer um, who famously stated, never underestimate the bandwidth of a station wagon full of hard drives. Uh, His point was that the, compared to the cost of moving bytes around, everything else is free. And so that's the reason we have a layer two cache right next to the CPU, because it's very expensive to do this stuff. Computing is cheap, storage is cheap, but moving stuff from the computer to memory, uh, from the hard drive to memory, from the uh, from one cloud to another or whatever else is extremely costly. And so if that's the biggest cost, then raw economics, a very simple model, would say, therefore, all the data should be right next to itself. And we have joked in the past that um, in the old days, you used to download a file to the computer. Now you upload the computer to the file. So if you have, I, I talked to one guy who said, I've got, I, it took me four weeks and 15 minutes to analyze my data. And I said, that's a weird number. He said, yeah, four weeks to upload it, 15 minutes to run the query. Is he ever going to download it again? No. He had this stuff in Google, in this case, using BigQuery. And he's simply going to write new code in the form of an app engine script or whatever the next time he wants to analyze the data. The, da- the data. So we now upload the computer to the, to the machine. That suggests that, that all the economics of data and, and the cost of moving bytes around are going to lead to one big amorphous pool of stuff in the middle, which is obviously a huge issue for matters of national security, matters of, of um, you know, national self-interest. I talked to people in Canada about this. They're like, well, this is a really terrifying idea because it means all of our data is going to move to the U.S., and that gives us no sort of rights of sovereignty over our data. So I think that's where you thought this model might apply. Very much so, but it also brings up an interesting concept in that um, we already deal with a model very similar to this today um, with something that at least I personally think right now is is more important to me than data, and that's with uh, currency and money. Uh, so we already have this odd set of interactions where all of our money clumps together in banks in the financial system, and then that has governance from each of the different government entities, and money is exchanged electronically, uh, transferred from institution, institution to institution, and it's also transferred across borders. Um, but you could very much, you don't know where your money is exactly at any given time unless you put it into a physical, say, safety deposit box or something like that. Otherwise, you have this magical account that gives you access to your money, and at some point you can convert that into something physical by going to a bank or an ATM machine, assuming that you continue to have access to that money. Um, I and think we have immense trust that something in the banking system won't suddenly make our eva- money evaporate. I mean, if you're in Cyprus right now, you go, oh, look. 
they just rounded me down <laughs> quite a lot. That's right. And it's, that's a digital transaction, right? It's a really interesting point. I'm sort of thinking in cloud we trust. And, and I think that we are in some ways more trusting with our money and have been for years than we are necessarily with our baby pictures, which is a, a very interesting idea when you talk about data gravity and where things actually reside in the physical world. Now. Well, I think the assumption is always, you know, the, one of the reasons that Visa writes off millions and millions of dollars in online fraud all the time is because that's the tax for being the default currency of the internet. Mm. And I think in in those cases, um, you know, if you read the old the book, The Big Switch, um, one of the criticisms I had of that book is that you can't draw a clear analogy between an electrical utility and computing because if I steal your electricity, all I get is electrons. So if I steal your computing, I get your trade secrets, I get proprietary information. One could argue that your money, in as much as there's a representation of it, is a bunch of bits. And if there's a glitch, that money goes away. They can restore it because they're just numbers. Now, mm -hmm. you have to prove you have those numbers, but they're just numbers. They can't restore your baby pictures from scratch. They're not just numbers. They're intimate family pictures that are priceless. So it is the uniqueness and the, it, it's, in some cases, the recoverability of the financial system that we trust in, not necessarily the system itself. Well, <clears throat> and the difference is that... Um, as you mentioned, it's it's simply a number. It's much easier for me to store the total information of, uh, you know, Alistair had $5 million in this account. And effectively, that's all I need of a record to restore that. But if you think about our digital selves, the baby pictures, the resumes, the records, the paychecks, the all of the other things, um, your taxes, whatever you happen to have decided to keep electronically, um, you can't easily reconstitute that. Um, and it also, in, at least in my opinion, in some cases has a much higher value than just the digits of the dollars. And I think that's really where, where things are headed, um, is that uh, information, um, data, and, uh, and such has a much, much higher value than, than even currency. You can generate currency from data and information. Um, you can't easily generate data and information from currency unless you acquire it. So if I go they, they to They just said you can't buy happiness, but that was like <laughs> a really geeky way of saying it. You can well, gener generate, you know, a good I, life from enough data, no? And I, I, I love the conversation in terms of, I think, when people talk about cloud, it's a much maligned, you know, buzzword in our industry. But I, I love the conversation we're having immediately makes it real for people in this way of... Um, you know, we've got the great thinkers and architects of cloud here, and and these are real life situations. This sort of brings it home of why we're doing this, the role technology plays in our lives, and where it's evolving. Well, I think so. it, it's fair to say that um, cloud computing on its own is not that interesting. Everything interesting about clouds to me is about data. Uh, that's why I think the data gravity angle is so right. If I tell you I have 50 computers, there's no problem getting them all to work. But as soon as I want to open an email on one of those computers and have the other 49 know the email was open, now I'm dealing with synchronization. Every performance bottleneck, almost every performance bottleneck, every I.O. issue has to do with things like even, even WAN performance is a caching issue, which is data, right? So um, if you look at the NoSQL movement, which was horribly badly named, it should have been called the NoJoin movement, the act of joining data together so that you can do things simultaneously and, and have it sort of locked down um, and have a, a change in one place be a change in all places is a data problem. Um, one of the one of the big insights that cloud has given us. Be, be careful though. It, it's either a data or a distance time problem. Sure. If you if if the WAN was not an issue, because you could cache everything every, everywhere, then it would be no problem. As soon as you need to maintain synchronization, you need the same data in every place, which is speed of light WAN That's distance right. problem. Absolutely. So um, what fascinates me about this whole problem is. We've learned about things like eventual consistency. In the data storage world, um, traditionally, databases were very much like transactional records. Uh, I'm going to lock this information down while I change it, and then everyone will be, all the information will be accurate. Imagine if Facebook was built that way. So if I want to update my Facebook page, we're going to freeze all of my friends' Facebook until I'm updated, and then we're <laughs> going to go save, right? That just would not scale. So this idea of what, what, what's been called eventual consistency, that eventually all those updates will be okay for everyone else, but not all at the same time, is something that businesses go, yeah, that's fine for Facebook. We would never use it. And I always tell people to look at the bottom of their bank statement where it says, you know, the transactions on this may not be up to date as of two days ago. That's right. Your bank statement is eventually consistent. Your entire We're talking about the banking system. The banking system is predicated on eventual consistency, and we're fine with it. 
And yet, for some reason, enterprises go, oh, I can't use this cloud data stuff because i got to have, you know, acid normal databases with transaction locking. That's horse pucky. You use it all the time. You use eventual consistency. And by relaxing the constraints on data, we could dramatically improve what we can do with it. I absolutely agree with that, which it's interesting if you look at what Amazon does with the shopping cart, right? That's one of the classic eventually consistent stories. Uh, everything is you're looking and seeing the availability of the items and everything else, and you're surfing the Amazon site and shoving stuff into your shopping cart. All of that is based on eventually consistent systems. Uh, each one, each time you put something in the shopping cart or you look, that isn't a transaction. That's an eventually consistent uh, system that's supplying that. But uh, they do have a transactionally consistent system when you go to actually buy the stuff. Um, but the idea is you only have to build a a uh, an acid compliant system large enough to deal purely with people actually hitting the I'm buying it and here's my credit card information. Outside of that, everything else can be eventually consistent. Much easier to scale, much easier to maintain, uh, and that's what enterprises should be doing. Right, um, and very few are. And that it's that moment on Amazon when it goes, I'm sorry, this item isn't in stock, or hey, it turns out we can't ship it here. That's when you find out. They don't want to hassle you with that until the moment you know when that actually is going to happen. This is how I think people need to reconsider architectures when they move to the cloud. Is all these ideas like you know no no join databases, eventual consistency. These are pretty obvious ideas we're we're comfortable with in our day to day lives. But for some reason, when we put them in the cloud, they're like, oh, that's bad. I can't possibly do that. I, it, it continues to be a fascinating thing for me of how we think we look at things differently the minute you slap the word enterprise. You know, B2C versus B2B. Whenever things we would not tolerate in our B2C lives, we uh, we want, we are, but this is B2B. Um, it, it often means it should be boring or outdated. Well, but <laughs> and, and you've also got to remember the history, the context of history here. Um, imagine I said to you, I have a new propulsion system for cars, right? It's really good. I mean, it has tremendous kinetic energy storage, um, really, really uh, easy. Basically, it's just you have to pull up and hose an incredibly explosive flammable liquid into your vehicle every 500 miles or so. <laughs> and by the way, if you bang into someone else, this may ignite and explode all over the place. Uh, it can cause cancer. Uh, you might get it on your hands and it'll burn them. And um, you're going to drive down the road at a high speed, maybe 100 miles an hour, uh, in some cases, in a car that's filled with this stuff. Wait, and it blinds you and it's poison. Yeah, it's poison. <laughs> would you ever do this? Oh, by the way, you know, the results of getting it out of the ground are bad and so on. Nobody would ever green light that, and yet that's what we're complaining about. So we always say, oh, we can't possibly adopt this new hybrid technology. We can't possibly use batteries. Well, have you really looked at the, the alternative? It's very easy to say the status quo is good, when in fact the status quo may be absolutely awful, but we've forgotten it because we're not looking at it with the same lens as this new thing that's under scrutiny. I think in many cases for cloud, that's what happens. You know, we I have backup and storage across a whole bunch of different Dropbox mach machines and I have it all over my house, I probably have 10 copies of everything I do in Dropbox. That's probably better than most enterprises. And yet most enterprises say there's no way I'm using a technology like that. Can we have a big data unsafe at any speed campaign? <laughs> Actually, it's interesting you mentioned Dropbox. You ha uh, I have the, uh, the pack rat option turned on. Yeah. Every single change is incrementally backed up right. so I can go to any revision. I don't know of any enterprise that has something Absolutely. like that in place. None. From day one, yeah, for early adopters, they let you keep that on. And they were like, you can turn it off if you want. If not, we'll keep your data forever I, and, and with every version, right? As a side note to listeners, and you may be a guilty party, I think it's funny when I ask, I, I'm like, hey, let's just delete that. Never say that to a storage person. Yeah. They're like, oh, I've already got 72 copies. That's and it's right. backed up on four clouds. <laughs> That's right. That's right. So... Um, Getting us back onto the, uh, the the data gravity conversation. So we were we we're sort of midstream, if you want to pick that back up, in terms of... Uh, uh, the gravity theory of trade. The gravity theory of trade. Which is no longer... I mean, your Nobel Prize was for the new version you're going to present tomorrow. <laughs> right? We had some distinction of whether this was a Nobel, a Nobel. <laughs> Prize, yes, very much so. Well, so later on... Uh, it really ended up boiling down to figuring out uh, how deeply the network affects things, which is what uh, what you were alluding to, Alistair, before. You were talking about how uh, uh, how the station wagon uh, bandwidth is uh, is a really powerful thing, and, and it really is. Uh, what I ended up getting to is the fact that everything is tied to latency and bandwidth. So 
Uh, for those that aren't directly familiar with latency and bandwidth, uh, you can think of latency as how fast the car can drive down the highway. Um, and bandwidth is how many lanes of highway, so how many cars can drive at the same time across. And that determines um, how much uh, stuff you can throw across the pipe versus how quickly it can travel. Um, there's really a function of do you move the process to the processing to the data or the data to the processing. And that's really what the trade-off of, of the core of data gravity is all about. How, uh, how benefited are you of moving what you have closer to that data? And in some cases, the data just becomes so large that it can't be moved across a network we have today. If you have five petabytes of data um, and, you have, uh, and you have a small bit of logic that you want to run, probably makes sense to try and move the logic instead of moving all the data. Yet many, many people just immediately go to, oh, I'll just move the data around. Uh, in the same, in the opposite problem, you could have some type of HPC problem where you have a tiny bit of data and you're trying to look at every possible combination. You're doing gene, you know, a protein folding or something. And it's, protein folding is what we say when we don't want to say cracking passwords because that might be considered illegal. Sure, or we could apply <laughs> rainbow tables and uh, you want to run a giant set of rainbow tables against uh, a set of hashes and see if you can find a match to uh, to crack a password or something else with GPGPUs. The, the, the reality is uh, uh, the operations are easy, but it's very compute intensive. In that case, it makes sense to uh, to send the data to the compute. So both are valid. It's deciding which one you're going to be more advantaged. But don't, don't you think that that also means that having since since the workload is going to vary, having the data and the compute right next to each other makes a lot of sense. It does, except that you run into scale limitations. Um, you run into ideally what what is the perfect computer? It's a mainframe that uh, that is in, can be infinitely sized, uh, and the bus does not uh, end up dissipating in performance, no matter how large you make it or how many lanes you decide to add. So, is that the future of computing? Um, I think it, it could be. The guy from IBM was right. We really owe the deal in like five mainframes of the world. Just well, turns out they're maybe, really big clouds. Maybe a few more than that for uh, for redundancy purposes. Right. Uh, but yeah, you know, <laughs> why why if you think about it, if you had a fast enough, uh, high enough bandwidth network, um, why couldn't you? Um, and if you think about a single computer, it's really a network of components, which is what you're talking about. You have a PCI bus, you have Northbridge, Southbridge, you have all of these components. They're networks. It's just. A PCI bus, a bus is a network. You attach things to it, and it sends things across it. That's a network. It's just really, really fast and, and very high bandwidth. It's 256 gigabits per second, uh, something like that. That's that's high bandwidth. Even the, like the layer two ta cache on a chip is, is the same thing. It's a computer network. and a storage device. That's right. So you would have solved the monkey Shakespeare problem differently. Instead of a thousand monkeys banging out to try to get the uh, works of Shakespeare, you would have networked those monkeys. That's what I'm hearing. A few monkeys, the right network. Yeah, someone actually did monkeys. that. They actually used a, uh, one of the guys at a conference I was at recently did a Hadoop project where he built this Hadoop thing and tried to see how many iterations until it would generate works of Shakespeare. And actually did all the math on it. It was pretty funny. <laughs> That's problem. The problem is, and this comes back to a topic I spent a lot of time thinking about on the data side, is um, computers are really good for optimization. Humans are really good for inspiration. So those computers can bang out every possible, possible iteration of, of um, Shakespeare, but it takes a human to go, that one looks like Shakespeare, right? Or that one sounds nice. Well, um, I did a design now, experiment. For now. I did a design experiment with uh, 99 Designs. We were trying to make a logo for Lean Analytics, this book. And um, I mistakenly, although I thought I was being clever... So they have three tiers. They have like $400, $600, and $800. I thought, well, I'm going to price my contest. Instead of their gold level at $600, I'm going to price it at $610. Because then I'll come in at the top of the $600 level. So I get the gold level attention, but I'll have a slightly more show up at the top of the list. Clever me, right? Turns out their UI goes, oh, you said $610. I will give you unwashed masses level with a $610 prize, not gold level. Awesome. 2,600 submissions later. And I mean, some of these submissions were like, learn analytics. Like, <laughs> like, one of them, I kid you not, was like a calligraphy pen, three hearts, and clip art. At least half of them looked like they were designed in PowerPoint. I, and I can't legally show you these things because yeah. they're designers. We eventually, uh, I'll, I'll finish the story later, but um, it, was, it took 20 hours of my time to go through this. And I had people yelling at me. It's, it was basically, it went from, I'm doing a design contest to, I am checking my spam folder. 
Like, that's what it felt like. And half of them were Nigerian royalty. Why are you not like my design? And I'm like, you know what? There's a growth industry here. It's called crap weeding. I need someone to start to go through they, this and just no, curate crap. They already have that. It's called mechanical turf. Yeah. It's by Amazon, and you just say... But now I need to inform Turk. What I needed to do is say, if this is nonsense, please get rid of it. Right. What's actually devolved to in that world is now when the conference, when the contestants get down to their finalists, they all use Google Image Search to find something close and then flag the other competitors for copyright infringement because something... Because guess what? Everything's been drawn once. So Google Copyright goes, oh, this looks somewhat... Uh, Google Image Finder finds it similar. Then they get awesome. discounted. So we found the person we wanted. They got kicked off the contest because someone flagged them as having used clip art, which they hadn't, but we couldn't use their logo. It was a complete train wreck. So we have all these problems wow. where we get into a world that's data-driven and we have computing and we can go to the wow. corners of the earth and have people in an internet cafe in you know, deepest, darkest Africa or, or Malaysia somewhere working on artwork. And, and, it, and you think this is going to be beautiful and all it turns into is way more crap to wade through. Inverse patent trolling. There's so many things there. Oh, the yeah. Shakespeare monkeys, like all my favorite memes, all in one story. <laughs> that was pretty awesome. It was brutal. Except terrible at the same time. Yeah, so the, the, the punchline for this story is the reason we use 99 Designs is because a guy named Les Parsons, who's a great designer I've been working with for 20 years, was too busy. And so I told, I said to Les, look, Les, you've done, and he's done like seven or eight company logos for me. I hired him at Coradiant, brilliant guy. And I said, look, Les, I can't do this. I'm going to use 99designs. He goes, okay, no problem. I go through the little contest. The guy that won, because you, you narrow it down to six designers. We couldn't take the guy that won. He was um, flagged by one of the other users. So he went with the guy who did the second logo, which was kind of nice. And we thought, we could use this for a t-shirt. It's still a waste of money. But we can use it for a t-shirt. And then we went to the part where you pay the person, and it was Les. This designer that I've worked with, he goes, yeah, I thought I'd enter one and see if you could pick it. So out of 2,600 pieces of artwork, the guy I chose was this guy I've been working with for 20 years. Talk about knowing your client. So it, it just destroys every genius. crowd service. Like every crowdsourcing theory I've ever heard is gone. So did he give you a $610 discount? No, I paid him there. more than I usually do. <laughs> but I have a great story. You, you paid him more and you blew 20 hours. I know, it's <laughs> terrible. Through. That's uh, awesome. however, however, he did for about 75 bucks make the logo we wanted based on... Uh, other ideas we had so but it was it was such a great example of like we talk about this world where it's wonderful and crowdsourced and you know everything's flat and big data and clouds and i'm like no you wind up waiting through 2600 pieces of shit <laughs> that is totally interesting Amazing. yeah so Amazing. that's uh, interesting. so the book you want to hear more so no let's, let's hear, hear it from dave i'll tell you about the book later dave, okay. tell, dave tell us what you're going to tell us about tomorrow uh, well, so it's interesting. Um, uh, I think it's it will be interesting to hear more about the book, which uh, I've, I've looked at it, uh, but not since it was in beta. So curious to... <laughs> yes, yes, I did actually buy the book in beta. Um, the e-book. Uh, so... A lot of uh, a lot of the past year, I've been spending trying to do uh, trying to do research into what really causes data gravity uh, beyond simply the accumulation of, of more data. Uh, so more data and more use um, uh, end up causing uh, even more data and more use. It's kind of this uh, virtuous cycle. But I couldn't really figure out why or what the real deep meaning of of the origin of data gravity itself was, and uh, that took me down uh, roughly a year of research into all sorts of different spaces, uh, looking at physics and uh, thermodynamics, entropy, uh, looking at uh, looking at uh, information theory, uh, entropy derived from information theory, a Shannon measure of information, uh, looking at uh, thermoeconomics, looking at uh, quite quite a few different and diverse uh, uh, concepts. It should be clear to listeners at this point that Dave is the smart one. No, no, no. <laughs> uh, so the the outcome uh, is is a model that I'm proposing that's around kind of four uh, four discrete cycles. That then uh, that then connect to each other. So the first is data, which is kind of what we uh, what we've at least for the most part been talking about. It's interesting in that we all lump uh, uh, what data is together as the same thing. Uh, the irony is that if you look backwards uh, of what really matters, um, and you look at the overall broad field that uh, Joe Public uh, in a classic enterprise. It's IT, and that's information technology. It's not data technology. 
and we confuse data and information all the time and they are unique and different things. Um, so that was one of the uh, early discoveries that I made is that um, while we all refer to data, there's a difference between data and information. Okay, so break that down for us. Uh, my sure. English major self kicks in here. Sure, so uh, here's a bit of data. Um, 32. <laughs> That's some data. Q. Good. <laughs> yeah, Apple. Q. Yeah, there's, there's some data for you. Okay. You have no idea what to do with that. I mean, there's a few well, I things. I can put it to can... zero because metric's a better system than Fahrenheit, but that's just my I, I didn't, but I didn't say I know, it it's Fahrenheit. just my reaction <laughs> when I hear 32 is why you guys still measure be, things by feet. It could be my waist size <laughs> in inches. It could be. Um, it is, but, uh, it, but it could also be temperature. You don't know because you have no context or anything else to, to move with. So uh, when you make the leap to information, I can say 32 degrees Fahrenheit, and now you have a lot more information. Right. Uh, you, you now know that we're talking about temperature, and, uh, uh, and you know that it's uh, being measured in Fahrenheit. Um, so data is, information is data in context? It's data in context uh, uh, with, uh, with some uh, semantic clues. Uh, and then, uh, and then there's the third phase, which is knowledge. And so we have some predetermined bits of information that we've all collected. In fact, I'm sure all the listeners have. So when I say 32 degrees Fahrenheit, you now you now associate with your with your knowledge that, hmm, 32 degrees Fahrenheit is not only a measurement, uh, but it's also uh, uh, where water freezes. Uh, water freezing also cre- is is the creation of ice. Um, it also means it's, yeah, it, it's, it works. it's also cold, um, and it, if I say uh, if I say if I add a little bit more information, um, and I say uh, 32 degrees Fahrenheit uh, today outside, uh, you might also base that on uh, on previous experience that you should wear a coat because it's cold. Um, so you decide to wear a coat. And that's actually the fourth phase is you've taken action based on the combination of the information and the knowledge. So you're now taking action based on this flow of things. So, so Okay, so sorry to interrupt one sure. more thing. So I drew a picture because I think visually. So is it concentric circles? I, I should point out she's holding the picture up to the microphone. I am. So microphone, look at it. Um, <laughs> I, I'll share it with the viewers later. I'm really quite the artiste. So data inside information inside knowledge. Is it concentric or is it overlapping? It is, uh, think of it as a series of four circles. So, uh, and the four circles um, uh, basically attach to one another. So you can think Mm. of them as uh, one circle with an arc connecting to the next circle, with another arc connecting to the next circle, and with a final arc connecting to, to the last. Uh, those aren't arcs, but uh, the, <laughs> I yeah, this four, this, four this separate circles. Right the book, so, <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so these, so these circles. If you look at the flow that I just described, um, is uh, is interesting. And then I started to think about uh, well, what happens when you take an action? When you take an action, um, you get a result. And that result ends up potentially creating new knowledge, or it may generate uh, information. Or it could generate more data. So what you end up with is a series of feedback loops. So you end up with uh, with what are uh, a set of feedback loops between all of these things. Okay, one other big uh, question. Sorry. Sure. Um, big data then, misnomer. Is it big information we're talking about? So that's where things get really interesting. This is where I've told a few people that I'm going to... Uh, uh, discount a lot of big data because people are talking about big data, big data, big data. Um, businesses in reality don't care about big data. They want information. Uh, it just so happens that if you have a big chunk of data, you might be able to get some information out of it. Uh, that That's where things get really interesting is how do you get the information out of it? How do you then apply it to the knowledge you have or build your knowledge base so that you can leverage it to take action? And really what businesses care about is being able to take some type of action off of that. So big data is great, but if you can do nothing with the data, um, then it's not useful. Yeah, if and you the, get and the 99 the re- designs and you end up hiring your own designer, you know, you had a pre so, so, I mean, the problem with big data is that it's... Um, it's as, it is more nebulous than cloud, believe it or not. Um, the reality is that, and yes, I said nebulous. That was supposed to be it's clever. Supposed to nebulous. So um, <laughs> the problem with big data is that it's got a um, 
it's not just about a large amount of information. So one of the best definitions of big data was these, this 3V model, right? Volume, variety, and velocity. So a lot of information um, of varied si sizes and structures that you can get a result on very quickly. And in the past, we could get two out of three very easily. So I could say, I'm going to have a large volume of data. I give you a quick answer if it's in a very standardized format. Or I could say, I've got a small amount of data I can get you, uh, and it's varied, and I can get you a quick, but it's only small. What's really happening in big data, because it's not new. Anyone from like a Terramark or a Teradata, sorry, will tell you this has been around for a long time. What's new is the, the, the it used to be volume times velocity times variety equals a constant. And that constant has dropped dramatically. So 20 years ago, it was much cheaper to just hire an extra garbage collector than figure out where the, efficient, where the inefficiencies in garbage collection were. Today, because of all the drop in computing costs and so on, it's, it's trivial to go and um, find out, for example, where the potholes are or where the garbage collection is not getting done and fix that. And so I actually think big data is much, and I agree completely with Dave, that the big data is the big data movement, this movement, uh, which is not by any means about a large amount of information, is about the democratization of analysis. Because if you think about what you can do with Facebook graph search today as an individual, and I don't know if you've seen the actual facebookgraphsearches.com links, but family members of people in China who like Falun Gong, men seeking men in Tehran, Iran. These are searches you can do yourself. Employers of people who like racism. These are searches you can do yourself. Mothers of Jews who like bacon. Ten years ago, all the three-letter agencies in the world would have just soiled themselves for this kind of power, and today we give it to people at the top of the Facebook browser. One twenty-fourth, the average Facebook user is on for 60 minutes a day. That means one twenty-fourth of your time, you're sitting in front of a search interface that all of our secret agencies only dreamt of ten years ago. That is the ultimate democratization of huge power. And what happens as a result of that is what's interesting. I've always said that, that big data is interesting because it's where the, the rubber of humanity meets the road of technology. Like the bits are actually people now, right? And it's that intersection that becomes really fascinating because we are able to, we, we take it for granted that we can do things that were superpowers before. Um, what we've got to be careful of is the backlash from those. Uh, there was a great article today in Harvard Business Review um, that was talking about examples of this uh, biting back. So when you use machines and automation and data to make decisions, you do things like when Uber jacked its prices just as Hurricane Sandy was hitting New York City because it saw a surge and had to go backpedal. Or you do things like um, you use big data and uh, ubiquitous computing and sensors to have citizens flag all the potholes because that's cheaper and you wind up fixing all the potholes in rich neighborhoods because that's where people have cell phones and paid contracts. So we have a danger here that access to this data without proper context, without proper information, is going to lead us down paths where we'll trust the data in the absence of context and make horrible decisions. And it's interesting because I'm thinking again, as we're all participating in terms of building out the tools that enable, and it's you know it's it's kind of chilling. You have a moment where the data exists, but also the platforms that will eventually exist to be able to process, to take the logic to the data, et cetera, to be able to extract the intelligence. Well, one problem is, I mean, you studied in high school. Did you study stats in high school? Yes. Did you study calculus in high school? I did. Which one did you spend more time on? Um, statistics. You did. Almost everybody I know when they went to school oh, did. Which like, I thought you yeah. said, which do I do now? No, like, no. In school, now, you studied school, a lot calculus, more calculus absolutely. integrals and so on. You did a little bit of stats, but not much. Right. And then a lot of calculus. Absolutely. And if you ask people how many bridges, you know, how many did they calculate the acceleration due to their change in velocity on the way to work, or how many bridges did they design on the way, and they don't know. And then you say, how many times did you look at stats? You looked yep. at stats when you were deciding what to put on your pants, what, what kind of pants to put on, or who to vote for, or what the chance of rain was, all kinds of things. And we are not equipping a generation that desperately needs numeracy with the tools to evaluate the probabilities and to be circumspect about data. So I'll give you, and you guys at home could play along, I'll give you a funny example <laughs> of this. If I say to you, I have two children, at least one of my children is a girl. What are the odds that the other child is a boy? Law of independent probability, right? Almost everyone says 50-50. It's not. Because there's four possibilities. And I'll do this with my fingers and you guys can play along at home. There's boy-boy, girl-girl, girl-boy, boy-girl. Those are the four possible combinations. I told you at least one of them is a uh, girl, so we can eliminate boy-boy. Which means that of the remaining three, there's girl-girl, boy-girl, and girl-boy. Two-thirds of those are a boy. So there's a 66% chance the other child is a boy. Because by telling you at least one, I've introduced information into that. This is a common, it's a variant on the Monty Hall problem. It's a common problem for statisticians uh, to pose that it illustrates Bayesian information and, and introducing new information and stuff. 
And we do not think like that. As humans, we are terrible at this stuff. We evolved to uh, see false positives and patterns and correlations because nine times out of ten when we were out hunting that woolly mammoth and there was a sound behind us and we thought it was something and looked and there was nothing there, was worth it for the tenth time when it was a rival tribesman that you could kill, right? Unfortunately, today we see these false probabilities and correlations that leads to crazy magical thinking and we are just not equipped to deal with a world where we actually have data because we start to see patterns where they don't exist. I mean, there's a proven correlation between drowning and ice cream. If you eat ice cream, you are much more likely to drown. Does that mean we should ban all ice cream? No, it means that summertime people go swimming and eat ice cream. No, of course not. We need to immediately start a movement in the government to ban um, the sale of ice cream because it's a danger. That's right. Uh, Absolutely. <laughs> but we are moving into a world where we're going to have the ability to make huge correlations for almost nothing because that's what data does mm -hmm. without the decision-making apparatus to discriminate between correlation and causality and to think in a, in a uh, sort of a dis determined manner about this. And that's, I think... It's another way of saying what Dave was talking about, which is that um, if we take data and we take information, but we don't have context and we don't take action and we don't learn from the results of that, those actions and fold them back into our knowledge, um, we have computing is presenting humans with a false sense of competence that we're not ready to deal with. Well, it makes me think about the book Blink, which could take us down a, other, a whole other philosophical uh, rat hole, but uh, English major here <laughs> with math majors. It, it's funny because um, in, in the model I've created, all of the, uh, the forward and backward feedback loops are, um, are driven by uh, changes in uncertainty. They're probability loops. Right. And so each time you traverse, the only way you can traverse is if there's a change in probability. So right. it's a Bayesian network. Sure. Um, and... Uh, that was one of the other realizations I had was the fact that uh, nothing is sent across unless you've shifted the probability one direction or another. But it ha the, your uncertainty has to change or you haven't moved. So, uh, Dave, what's your Twitter, ha Twitter handle? Uh, it's at McCrory. That's uh, M-C-C-R-O-R-Y. So Dave said to us before this that he needs to come up with a name for this because grand unified theory of everything is already taken. Um, and there's people like Ken Wilbur and others. So if you have a name for Dave's theory, please feel free to tweet him openly and suggest names for this theory. But we're going to see the theory tomorrow, right? I'm only half kidding. We do actually need a name for it, but we're not going to bore you with that process. You, you will see the theory tomorrow. Um, actually, there's there are quite a few tie-ins because uh, I also... And, and let me jump in and say bye tomorrow because this podcast is going to be published a little bit later. So this is going to be happening at Cloud Connect, and I'm sure you're going to see the Twitter stream, and we're going to see more information around it. So we'll try to... Make sure there's something in the show notes so you can get access to some of the information. But as a marketer, the name Data Gravity was great because people were looking for this idea of, I, I had talked about data has surface tension, and that wasn't really mm -hmm. what I was looking for. Gravity really summed it up, right? And because I was sort of thinking of the T-1000 reconstituting itself, like when sure. AT&T got divested, it would eventually <laughs> do this, right? So what you're saying here is that there's that, that the, the future of computing is a future of gradually mining, of, of creating more data and then mining that data to a level of certainty that's higher, like to a higher it, probability state. That, that's right, which would, which would be a change in entropy, and it's also, it, it's basically a set of cybernetic feedback loops. Right. That's really what this is. This pattern is the same pattern um, that people have used but have not identified as being the same pattern um, I did discover one group that did identify it, but no one has spoken about it. Uh, so if you're familiar with OODA loops, um, this is the same thing that an OODA loop right. does. It's also, if you're familiar with the uh, PDSA or PDCA, depending on which school of thought that Short and Deming came up with, that's the Plan, Do, Study Act or Plan, Do, Check Act. Uh, same four phases, feedback loops the same way. Um, and it's where the whole idea of the Toyota Way and all of those things came from. That's that short and deming. John Willis talks a lot about them. So let me let me jump in here for a minute. So the the this is exactly the right time to talk about that cycle from the book. So um, along the same lines, um, Ben Yoskovitz and I have been writing this book called Lean Analytics, and the Lean Startup model, which was started by uh, it was a kind of a revolution in how to build startups, started by Eric Ries, is based on this idea that you should iterate towards the right product for the right market. And to do that, you have to um, continuously do just enough work to, so you have to identify the riskiest part of your business, do just enough work to reduce the risk to a level of certainty, and then iterate. And so... Um, to a level of acceptable certainty. Right, exactly. And then he says, build, measure, learn is that trifecta, right? And it's the same idea. And we actually have something in Lean So Lean Analytics is sort of a companion to Lean Startup, uh, where Lean Startup tells you, 
um, what you should do, why, why you want to build a, com a company in this way. Lean Analytics is very much um, how to do it. So it's uh, we identify six uh, Types, six, six sort of archetypes of business model, like e-commerce, which is transactional or user-generated content, which is media-based, or uh, software as a service, which is subscription-based. Um, and then we identify different stages that companies go through in growth. So they start out with empathy, getting inside their customer's head, uh, then stickiness, making sure people will continue to use the application, because if you can't get 100 people to use it, why would you want a million? Then virality, which is word of mouth, referrals, telling your friends, because that way, when you do finally spend money acquiring customers, you'll get more than one customer for every customer you acquire, and then scale. What we found is to move, so any of these particular stages, like an, an early stage e-commerce company that cares about certain metrics. One of the key metrics for an early stage e-commerce company is um, whether they are in acquisition mode or loyalty mode. So if very few of your customers buy from you again within a year, you're in acquisition mode. If a lot of them buy immediately from you again, you're in loyalty mode. Classic example would be a wedding ring store is in acquisition mode. All their money goes to acquiring new customers, getting as much out of them as possible. I'm sorry, no refunds. Would you like insurance with that? And I don't really care about one-click payment. Whereas um, a loyalty customer, oh, your fruit was spoiled at the grocery store you use every week? Let me send you a gift basket. Um, I'm going to have a button that says, buy what you usually buy. But I'm going to have lots and lots of loyalty-centric features. There's nothing wrong with being one business or the other. There's everything wrong with not knowing which business you are. Yeah, if you're a loyal uh, wedding store, wedding ring store, you've got a whole different exactly. relationship with a divorce lawyer down the street. Exactly, and, <laughs> and it turns out that you know, pizza store and wedding ring store are the polar opposites, which explains a whole bunch about the gender battles. So, and one quick question. So it sounds like, uh, I know you mentioned lean analytics in terms of startups, but it sounds like there's a lot of that all businesses can oh, yeah, benefit. Yeah, yeah. yeah this, absolutely. So this isn't just about and, and so it's, it's, it's this philosophy of find the one metric that matters to your business. Maybe mm. at that point it was the number of people who return within a 90-day period. Mm -hmm. Or maybe it's churn rate, for example. How many people do you lose from your business if you're a software as a service company? And it turns out there's a normal number. 2% is good. 2% a month is okay. We talked to companies that were killing themselves because they were losing 2% of customers a month. And they were actually doing really well. They should have been focused on something else. So the core idea in the book is there's, there's one metric that matters to you, and you have to get it to a certain goalpost or a certain line in the sand before you can move on. All of this comes back to what Dave was saying because the way you get it there is through what we call this lean analytics cycle where you pick a metric that matters, you identify an experiment that can move the needle on that thing, and the experiment can either be I made something up or I looked at the data to formulate that experiment. You run the experiment, and then if you find out did I move the needle or not, if you moved it, go on to the next thing. If you didn't move it, should I redefine the goalposts? Should I try again? Should I give up, right? And there's this, this cycle which is, I mean, very, very similar of I figure out what matters, I form a hypothesis, I design an experiment, I measure the results. And the whole idea here is to do this to move towards a position of greater certainty. And I think if you look at Shannon's law of information, you're talking about trying to get greater certainty. We had much more certainty about it's 30, 32 degrees Fahrenheit outside than we did about 32 in terms of what the information was, right? We, we were able to move that by adding data, more data, the metrics, and so on to that. One of the issues that I think is fascinating, I want to ask you how, how you respond to that uh, idea is, uh, so I have a lot of pictures on Flickr. And I took a picture when I was in Israel of this giant domed mosque. And it's one of the few pictures for which hundreds of people have said, that's a nice picture. Can I use it? People have used it in travel brochures and stuff. It's a Creative Commons license. If I were to move all my pictures from Flickr to SmugMug, I would be dropping the entropy or sorry, be increasing the entropy, because I would be taking that and it would be just a picture. It would no longer be a special picture. So data in the cloud, especially data that's in an application, gathers moss. Mm -hmm. And when I move it, I shake that moss off because while the picture is mine, that information about this being high ranking or this being the, the metadata that was provided by other people, the comments, was part of Flickr. I didn't get that. So, so one of the issues is when you move your data to a shared environment, it accumulates metadata that you no longer control. Right. And that becomes sort of um, a form of gravity, if you will. It's a reason not to move I, it. I find it funny because you continue to use data over and over again, yet you're really mixing data and information. And so you mentioned the metadata. The metadata is actually what turns the data into information that's useful. So when you moved it, you actually extracted the data, moved it over, but without the context, you now don't have 
you don't have it applicable as information. So that's why it actually reduced in value is because you just shifted its state back over from being information back to just being data. And it has and to recollect information. It, it has you will to have to reapply the context and the semantics around it for it to then gain the value as information again because data in and of itself doesn't have value, which is a whole other conversation around how you derive the value of data, which was a whole that was like four or five months of research to, to get to that point. But it's interesting because data in and of itself has very limited value. Information, however, has incredible value, which is calculable as well. And, and the um, concept of that platform actually matters because I was thinking about what you were saying before about moving logic to data, which could, could pull something that you could then extract information and knowledge from. And this same concept, again, at a layman's level of platforms that we choose to exhibit data on lead to the accumulation of information and knowledge and therefore, again, increasing the cost. Well, and, and in Dave's model, when you fear lock-in, let's say I'm using mm -hmm. a CRM tool and I want to leave, the problem with leaving is that I get all my customer records, which still have some, there's some information there. I know their names and addresses. I know the fields. But I've, rem I've drastically removed the utility of that stuff because I can no longer use it with the application. So the application provides context to the data in the use. And, and so platform lock-in consists of the, uh, the threat of a reduced amount of, the threat of increased entropy in my data. Mm -hmm. Which is actually the, one, of the, one of the punchlines, so to speak, of, of the talk tomorrow shows mm -hmm. that the last four circles, you have data, application, uh, you have interface and action. And effectively, those follow the exact same cycle. And the 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 goal when you're shifting through uh, each of these cycles is the faster you can move through them, the more advantaged you are versus everyone else. Right. So if you can pr compress the cycle time or shrink how long it takes you to move through each of those phases, you're advantaged versus someone else. I need to send you that business singularity thing that uh, on radar a couple of weeks ago because it was exactly that. It was this like. If you get the cycle time down, you hit us. You basically get towards an asymptote of I can just learn so much faster than you that I look like a superhuman and you look like ants, and that's there's right. no point in competing. Th that's right, and, it's, and that's the same model that the OODA loop follows right. as well. Is uh, you get into your opponent's decision loop, right. and effectively you win. Uh, and so it's applicable to all of these things. They all follow that exact same pattern. Um, so you should just call it data entropy instead of data gravity. Uh, <laughs> But it's not about the data. I don't care. It's it. I'm telling you what the marketer wants. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, well, the problem is most people don't understand entropy. Yeah, but it sounds cool. <laughs> it, it does. It sound does. Cool. But uh, I had a great conversation with Kevin Kelly about this at Food Camp last year, and he he's got a bunch of people together. We were all way too tired and didn't have enough coffee. And he said, "How would you detect life in the universe?" And we tried a bunch of different things. And, you know, there was the usual people kind of hung over going, I don't know, oxygen. He's like, no, wrong, no, wrong. He was nice about it. But the eventual conclusion was something that he calls extropy, which is that life tends to organize itself against the eventual heat death of the universe. So extropy is this tendency towards organization, right? Even if you were a silicon life form, you would be trying to structure yourself in the form of whatever your DNA would be or some kind of structure that was the opposite of the eventual decay of everything into a bunch of evenly distributed hydrogen atoms. And so he talks about extropy as a, when you look for life, you should be looking for signs of organization that are going the opposite way to entropy. And so it would be interesting to look, I mean, he calls this extropy and entropy, the two creating information or redu removing information from a system. It's interesting. Um, so I've read a few papers on different aspects of, uh, of entropy, and uh, I agree with this hypothesis. I don't know if I agree with exactly the, the terming he uses, uh, but he's right in that uh, life seeks uh, reduction in entropy. Um, that's true everywhere and anywhere. Um, if you think about uh, what computers do for us, ideally, uh, they reduce entropy. Uh, a lot of people... Uh, wonder about the definition of entropy. Um, there's a physics definition of entropy around thermodynamics, um, and then there's an information theory uh, definition of entropy. Uh, it's interesting if you think of uh, entropy uh, in life as uh, as a measure of the disorder of things. It's certainly an easy way to uh, to kind of put things into perspective. I believe 
uh, entropy is a measure of uncertainty. Um, That's certainly the information theory. No, actually, after after Shannon's a lot of research, law doesn't say that that's. I mean, no, no, no. I'm I'm agreeing, but I'm saying it's actually encompasses. What I'm saying is that Shannon's measure of information, or the information theory definition of entropy, actually it, uh, is a superset of thermodynamic entropy. Sure. And most people do not model things that way. They model things in the reverse. They believe that thermodynamic entropy came first and that it is a superset of what would be an information theory based entropy. But I think to That's most, to most lay people entropy looks like the static on a TV screen when you're not tuning into something. And then as you find a signal, the static goes away and you start to see a picture. Static is this reasonably random looking distribution of black and white pixels that just looks like noise. And the heat death of the universe is sort of physics entropy is that's what all the atoms look like. And the information theory says from static TV you got nothing and anything better than static is somehow more information, right? So these things are all sort of the same, but it's everybody chopping at the same problem of saying when there's massive disorganization indistinguishable from randomness, there's no information in there. And as you provide data and then you provide context to the data, you've created additional um, information. Tell me about the action the part. Yeah, so tell me about the action part. Because sure. once I act on it, I'm not inherently adding more information by acting on it unless I also learn from that action. Correct. So it's a feedback loop. But again, if there's no shift in, if there's no shift in uncertainty, you've not changed the probability, so you haven't learned anything. But you can still carry out an action. If, I've, if I already know that it's when it's cold outside, I should put on a jacket, I can still take the action of putting the jacket on. I haven't learned anything new, but I did stay warm. Well, you may have reinforced the fact that it was a good idea to put on a jacket minutely. So, yeah. Potentially, may go, hey, I've learned something. Potentially, you may have, you may have, uh, you may have changed uh, the uncertainty and you did learn something. Right. Or it may be the 50,000th time right. and you've learned absolutely nothing. Or you, no well, benefit. I mean, the way your brain works, you've reinforced a very, very strong, resilient neural pathway already, so it didn't really notice. Right. So there really has been a, a net, net, near zero gain. This is why my daughter still doesn't wear jackets in the cold. <laughs> Thus, That's will big data actually change that? These, these are the questions. So we're we're running out of time here, and uh, I was going to leave it to you guys if you wanted to to ask each other one last question. You're here. We've got the mic. What right. you, you've got the person in front of you. What's the what's the any any last question? I got one. Or? So how is this new thing, which we're not going to call data entropy or extropy or something? How is it going to change the future of music as we know it? Uh, how will it change the future of music? Uh, that's an interesting question. Um, I don't know if it will directly change the future of music. I think the future of music is uh, something that uh, is really being discovered right now. I think we're starting to see. I think we're starting to see interesting things happen again uh, in the music industry and in the business. Uh, but I, I don't think that's really known yet. I think that the music industry is finally starting to wake up and realize that uh, that it needs to start learning. So uh, I'll say from that aspect. Uh, so l let me, if I can, just follow up on that. So sure. before 2007, the radio stations used to use Arbitron with paper diaries that people would fill out. And in 2007, Arbitron introduced this thing called the PPM that went on your hip. And there was a tone in the radio station. Um, and so... We went from a world where a demographic panel would fill out a, library, a book each week saying this is what I listen to, to a world where there's a thing on your belt. And this completely changed the, the radio industry because before that time, radio stations would do things like they would um, do a contest at 8.25 in the morning because they knew that way you were going to stay on from, you were going to report having listened to the station from 8.15 to 8.30 and 8.30 to 8.45, which was coveted, right? Or they'd run the contests later in the week. Or they'd mention the radio call signs over and over later in the week because you were going to fill the thing out on your weekend. And so radio stations had like 50% market share in some cities. As soon as these things went on people's hips, we got rid of the lies in the marketplace because people were writing down stations even though they didn't actually listen to those stations. Uh, in some cases, they were intentionally doing it. Um, there were a lot of accusations of uh, Hispanic groups saying they listened to the Hispanic radio station because that was like subsidizing the advertising rates on that station, but they wouldn't actually listen to it. And now, with this thing on your belt, if you walk into a mall and there's country and western music playing, then for 20 minutes, you're a country and western fan. Uh, they would know immediately, and this company called Arbitron, which Nielsen is trying to acquire, and the FTC has just put a stop on the acquisition pending investigation, um, now knows when you change the channel. 
the consequence of this, which I would consider you've introduced much less uncertainty in the market. You no longer have these lies from people. You have an actual record of what's really happening since 2007. It's a fascinating case study. The consequence of this is that once upon a time, we used to play a song every four hours where it was in what they called heavy rotation. That same song gets played every 55 minutes now. When a song makes you turn off the radio, it's gone right away. You don't have time to learn because people know right away. This, the report comes in that day. This is what's causing people to change channels. Right? When they, when they, they will play that song every 55 minutes because they know when you hear that song, you're probably only listening for 20 to 30 minutes of time. You're likely to stick around for three more songs. And so here's a case where you've got a significant amount more data supplied in real time that's much more accurate, which the labels can use and the radio stations can use to determine programming that has led to a race to the bottom in terms of lowest common denominator music. How does the data-informed music industry reconcile with the industry that's trying to create the new, the novel, the interesting? Okay. Well, it's interesting. It's an interesting follow-up. I think the reality is if you apply it to the model, um, the, the model is not um, an unfiltered set of feedback loops. In some cases, you can be advantaged by filtering, or you can manipulate the model to be advantaged one way or another by filtering the feedback loops. Uh, and that works even at, at the highest levels, um, not only in different businesses to manipulate what's happening, but if you think about uh, even governmental entities choosing to uh, to put things or remove things from our publicly available news or something else. That's a filter on a feedback loop. So In the challenge here is this really cycle. is a grand unified theory of knowledge that you have to It's how do you it's yeah. it's how do you come up with the most advantage thing? It might be that I'm able to come up with a with a better way of creating or with a better way of uh, of giving you something with higher probability and the question is does the time it take me to run my algorithm, um, uh, do I get an offset of being more accurate, but someone else's algorithm can run faster? This is the Netflix accurate. prize, right? The, the winning prize was really, really good, but it took so long to compute, they didn't wind up using it. That's right. And so the financial industry struggles with this all the time. Uh, this is why for them, you know, microseconds matter is, is for this very reason. Uh, but this applies to everything. It, it, it does. Uh, the the music industry is undergoing a lot of change right now. If you look at what happened to EMI uh, and such, and I think the music industry probably has four or five more years of, of undergoing change to sort itself out with all of the changes in being able to get this information and to be able to uh, to make better decisions. And it's not going to be purely a a gut feel type of decision for. Uh, what artists uh, make sense to uh, to kind of put more behind, uh, to promote more. I think you're going to see a lot of changes. Uh, what those changes are going to be, I, I don't know. It, it it will be interesting, though. All right. And so, Dave, any uh, last questions for Alistair? Uh, so, I guess one thing that would be interesting, what would you say uh, was the most interesting thing you learned uh, as you were writing this uh, this book? It was astonishing to me how few people appreciate the value of focus. Uh, we had a lot of people say, oh, but i got to watch all these ten things. And in a startup, the most precious thing you have is focus. Because analytics is usually about showing how many people progress towards a goal. In a startup, analytics is about iterating your way to a market product or a product market fit before the money runs out. And if you look at software optimization, I mean, anybody who's ever done software development knows you find one metric you want, number of frames per second, whatever, you tweak everything else until that gets as high as it can be. You'd think that would be an obvious way to optimize stuff. But the problem is that, that figuring out what the most important thing in your business is right now is a really, really difficult skill. And we actually end the book with this anecdote um, about Archimedes. So the story of Archimedes was, you know, the king said, hey, I think I got ripped off. I got this crown here. It might not be gold. Archimedes says, I got it, I'll take care of it for you, but this might be a little difficult because that crown is an irregularly shaped solid and I can't really measure its volume. And then he went home and he had a bath because, you know, he, this is what Greeks did when they were perturbed. And he <laughs> sat down and the water went up and he went, I've got it, displacement. When the water goes up, I can measure the volume of something. And the apocryphal story is that he ran down the street screaming, I've got it, make it. The reality is he was a much smarter guy than that. He probably did it in a different way. But he nevertheless measured the volume of an irregularly shaped solid. 
And what I learned, and, and this is a great story, this actually came from an economist conference that was here a little while ago, but I, but I see this over and over again, is that Archimedes had taken baths before. There was nothing special about that bath. What was special was the king asking him a question. That question, because it was the right question, immediately he was literally immersed in the solution. And I think from a data-driven world, we have such an abundance of information that once upon a time, the person who was in charge was the person who could convince us to act in the absence of information, right? If you think about Don Draper and Mad Men, talking about the carousel and these lights before your eyes, and it's turning with the images, and you can see your childhood, and oh, you just want to hug the guy, right? Your hackles on the back of your neck, it's beautiful. That's because Don was a really convincing proxy for a market you couldn't know. And so whoever was the most convincing person in the room got to go to the boardroom. And so in the past, the leader was someone who convinced us to act in the absence of information. In a world where there's so much data, which really ties together both lean analytics and what you're talking about, um, in a world where there's so much data, the person who's smartest is the person who knows what questions to ask. Because if you can identify the right question to ask, you found the thing of the greatest uncertainty, and you've managed to move it to a level of tolerable uncertainty so you can move forward. And knowing what question to ask is, is a vastly underrated skill that I think when we talk to people, all the successful entrepreneurs were very good at knowing what question to ask and ignoring the ones that were distractions. And all of the lousy ones would just thrash by asking nonsense questions and looking at vanity metrics until they hit the wall at a million miles an hour. That is uh, an excellent takeaway, I think, as we uh, go into Cloud Connect this week and, and for all of us to be thinking about here in, in listener land. So uh, with that, we're going to, to leave you. We're out of time for this week. If you like the show, please tell a friend and leave us a review on iTunes, thus adding to knowledge and not just uh, data. We're adding information and Fight not just the data. podcast entry. <laughs> exactly. You can follow us on Twitter at thecloudcastnet or on the web at thecloudcast.net. Thanks for listening.